The Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth every 97 minutes, and this time it will transit the Terminator line twice. The Terminator line is an imaginary line that separates night and day. In each of these transitions, the temperature on the solar panel will vary between 86 and minus 70 degrees Celsius in minutes. This kind of rapid temperature change can cause spacecraft to malfunction in many ways. If the Hubble telescope or any spacecraft is to maintain long-term operation in space, it needs a way to control both its external and internal temperatures. The goal of the thermal control system is to keep the spacecraft within a certain temperature range. For spacecraft in orbit around Earth such as the Hubble, the main thermal challenge is when the craft crosses the Terminator line. In fact, weeks after the Hubble was deployed, engineers noticed that there were unaccounted vibrations occurring twice a day. These vibrations were traced back to the solar panel. As they crossed the Terminator line, the rapid change in temperature caused the support structure to either expand or contract unevenly. This in turn induced vibration into the entire telescope as onboard systems tried to compensate for the unwanted movement. Though the vibrations were small, it was big enough that observations were not taken at those times. The solution to the problem was to replace the solar panel with ones that were sturdier and heated up more evenly. Not too far from the Hubble is the International Space Station, the only habitat we have that's not on Earth. And because of this, it has a pretty complex thermal control system, but we're only going to concentrate on the basics of the habitable modules. The first step in thermal control is to prevent unnecessary heating. That is, heating that's not caused by operations necessary for the current mission. For most parts, this is solar radiation. In sunlight, the outside of the ISS can reach up to 121 degrees Celsius. So, the station is covered in multi-layer insulation. These insulations are designed not only to reflect heat from the sun, but also to reflect heat back into the station. The goal here is to thermally isolate the interior of the space station from space as much as possible. With the sun out of the way, we can now deal with the heat caused by operations required for the mission. Between the crew, which could be more than 10 at times, and the many computers and scientific instruments, a lot of heat is generated inside the ISS. This heat has to be removed somehow if the station is to maintain a room temperature environment of 22 degrees Celsius. You definitely don't want your astronauts sweating in zero G, and you also don't want them in sweaters either. Generating heat is usually easier than getting rid of it. That's why we have continuous surface operation for over a decade now on Mars, but less than one hour on Venus. The heat acquisition system, as it's called, in the habitable modules is a two-loop system. The internal loop is water-based with radiators and cold plates to collect heat from the interior. The heat is then transported to a heat exchanger that's attached to both the internal and external loop. The heat is transferred to the external loop, which uses ammonia as a heat transfer fluid because it's more efficient than water, but also toxic. That's why it's not used in internal loop. In the external loop, the heat moves from the heat exchanger to these huge radiators, which then radiates it into space. Heat transfer via radiation is the only way to get rid of heat in space, and it's slow, unlike in the movies. That's why large radiators are required for cooling to be effective. But sometimes, you need thermal control for data collection and not necessarily for protecting crew or equipment from overheating. This is the case with the James Webb Space Telescope. When it launches in the near future, it will have a huge sun shield which is critical to the mission, but not the spacecraft. James Webb will be observing the universe in the near and mid-infrared range. Most of the objects that it will be studying, objects such as distant galaxies and stars, will be very faint. This means that any stray infrared radiation that the imaging sensor receives will add noise to the observation data. Heat generates a lot of infrared radiation. And for this reason, the thermal control system of James Webb has to be pretty advanced. The near-infrared sensor has to operate at minus 236 degrees Celsius. This is achieved through passive cooling, cooling that doesn't require energy to function. The huge sun shield prevents the sun from heating the telescope side of James Webb. This will allow the passive cooling to cool the telescope and its supporting structure to minus 236 degrees Celsius. Since the supporting structure holds everything, including the 18 focusing hexagonal mirrors, 
thermal expansion of this structure has to be kept to a minimum. From 22 to minus 236 degrees Celsius, the supporting structure only expands 22 nanometers. For the mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI, operational environment is harder to achieve. The first issue is temperature. MIRI operates at minus 266 degrees Celsius, and passive cooling is just not cool enough to get the job done. So, active cooling is also used. The cooling is provided by a cryocooler, a refrigeration system that's distributed between the sun-facing side and MIRI. With all imaging sensors at operating temperature, there's one other issue that has to be dealt with. Funny thing is, this issue is due to the very fact that we are operating at a very low temperature. The analog signals that are coming from our imaging sensors are really weak and need to be digitized as soon as possible to avoid noise being added to the signal as it's being sent to other parts of James Webb for transmission to Earth. But, in order to do that, we need to stick our analog to digital or A to D system as close as possible to our imaging system on the cold side of James Webb. This means that our A to D system must also operate at these really low temperatures. But James Webb got that covered. The A to D system used is called sidecar and can operate from minus 243 to 26 degrees Celsius. Spacecraft thermal control is a serious challenge for spacecraft designers because in many cases, the goal of the thermal control system conflicts with other spacecraft design goals, such as the need to point solar panels into the sun, but not in a way that it will cause excessive heating of the spacecraft, or being able to point the spacecraft antenna towards Earth without exposing sensitive instruments to direct sunlight. I'd like to thank all of you out there that have subscribed and are sharing and spreading the word. We've passed the 100 subscriber mark. Not much, but then again, even the universe was at one time smaller than a subatomic particle. I'm DexDFX, but a celestial sphere.